Hello, everybody. Hello from uh, Cardiovascular Innovations 2017 here in Denver, Colorado. My name is Jader Sandoval, interventional cardiologist from Mayo Clinic, and I'm here with Dr. El Barani from uh, St. Boniface Hospital in Winnipeg, Canada, who's here to present us a case on extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Yes, hi. So I'll start with the uh, history. So uh, the patient is a 59-year-old gentleman who had a sudden cardiac arrest while driving. Luckily, he didn't have any cardiac accidents and was witnessed, so he, resuscitation efforts were started by bystanders. EMS arrived quickly. It was found to be in ventricular fibrillation, and he was uh, electrically cardioverted, intubated, and uh, was cooled in a peripheral center that is two hours away from the closest cath lab, so he's not cath at the time, and was extubated after 48 hours with full neurologic recovery. Um, and his initial presentation, there was no ST changes, uh, but there was a significant troponin rise. And as I mentioned, for geographical reasons, he was managed conservatively, was referred for an angio after he was extubated and with full recovery. He had an echocardiogram on the day of his arrest that showed an ejection fraction of 35%, but the report didn't mention any wall motion abnormalities. So I first met him when he, in the cath lab. I was the operator on that day. Uh, informed consent was obtained. He was alert, awake, doing quite well. And this is his angiogram. As you can see, he's got a minor left main lesion, but then he has a very tight osteal circumflex lesion. And this is a dominant circumflex. The osteum of the LED was free of significant disease. And you can see this again on the uh, spider view there. So thoughts on how to proceed? Luckily, where I operate, there is an interventional cardiologist working right across the aisle from me in another lab. Discussed the case with him briefly. We felt that his anatomy was suitable for, for stenting, um, but would require stenting of the left main into the circumflex. And my plan was to, to wire both the circumflex and the LED, um, and then do a, a form of balloon kissing to restore flow to the LED, to, to maintain good flow access to the LED. So I, I had gone radial, so I upgraded my radial sheath to a seven French slender. Uh, used an XB 3.5 guide, wired the LED on the circumflex, pre-dilated and then stented the left main into the circumflex with a 4 0 by 30 resolute integrity drug loading stent. And this is the stent being deployed. Now, unfortunately, after the stent was deployed, the patient became very agitated, dropped his pressure very quickly. And he, can you see from this picture, despite the osteum of the LED looking uh, free of significant disease, the LED had completely occluded. And this is how I felt on the inside at this point. So the patient became abruptly hypotensive and uncomfortable. Uh, I called my colleague from the next room who was trying to get a balloon pump going while I was trying to wire the LED. I tried to wire with the Pilot 50, uh, but very quickly within a few minutes, the patient went into PEA and we had started uh, code blue. The patient was, uh, we were doing CPR before, before, before you knew it. So at our center, we have a good liaison with the surg surg surgical department to try and initiate ECMO in these cases as soon as possible. And Early on, I'd actually started the process, uh, calling the surgeon in, um, and we were able to get the patient on VA ECMO within 23 minutes from his actual cardiac arrest. And this was bifemoral with a, with a uh, femoral uh, sheath and a, a venous femoral sheath as well. So now that we had the patient on ECMO, he was being perfused, but we still had the problem of the uh, coronary anatomy to deal with. So as you can see here, the, car the, the, the myocardium is in almost a standstill and the LED is still occluded. And surprisingly, this proved quite difficult to wire. I still had the jailed wire there. I tried crossing the side struts with a Pilot 50 and a Pilot 200 wire. Because I had the jailed wire, I tried to go around the stent with the microcatheter to try and at least crush the stent and restore flow to the LED, but couldn't cross the stented struts. At this point, we're starting to talk to the surgeons about taking them to the OR for bypass surgery for emergency lima to, uh, uh, graft to the LED. Um, However, surprisingly, a Miracle Bro 6, uh, which is a much stiffer wire, was able to pass through the struts. And you can see here, after ballooning, I've restored flow to the LED. The myocardium is, is now contracting and moving much better. So I ended up doing a cool-out procedure, a bifurcation of the left main into the LED with a 3.5 by 26 resolute integrity drug loading stent, um, and doing final kissing with two 3.5 uh, NC balloons. The, uh, you don't see it here, but the Miracle Bro wire had caused a distal LED dissection, so I had to deploy a stent distally there as well. And these were our final results. 
So the patient at this point at the procedure had actually a very good pulsatile pressure. He was actually moving his limbs around. I was intubated, of course, and sedated. He was kept uh, on ECMO overnight, decannulated the next morning, and it was extubated in the afternoon with full neurologic recovery. And I actually went to see him the next day. He was alert and oriented and didn't remember meeting me at all. So. Um, and his LV function, LV systolic function, by the time of discharge, had actually recovered close to normal. So I think this case demonstrates that emergency ECMO can be a useful tool um, when an unexpected sudden cardiac arrest occurs during PCI and allows time to address and manage complications. Uh, but for this to work, it has to be a, a, a lean machine where you, when you start plan to initiate this, you should have readily available ASAP. Let me ask you a couple of questions that I'm interested in. And one is, um, as you know, there's uh, some emergent interest in understanding because this patient presented with sudden cardiac arrest, right? Yep. Ventricular fibrillation. And um, there's um, some uh, variation, but some question as to whether those patients should undergo coronary angiography up front versus at a later time. Can you talk to us about the approach? Because here, you, you, your team did an angiography at 48 hours, 40 right, hours after neurological afterwards. recovery. What's your thought on that and those patients upon presentations, even in the absence of ST elevation? Yeah, so it's, and that's a very good point. Um, the limits are mostly geographical. Now, this patient is in a rural setting from our cath lab, which is two hours away. And when you have cardiac arrest and you're hemodynamically stable with no evidence of ST changes, um, you wonder whether cooling versus, versus immersion cornea angiography is more important. If this patient was uh, closer to our center, we would probably have done cath them right away uh, with the VF arrest or at least within, w w as soon as possible. But because this was a long transfer, that would interrupt cooling, uh, initiation of uh, hypothermia. And I think that was uh, probably why the decision was made to delay, uh, delay um, transfer. If there was clear ST elevation, then for sure he would have been transferred that right then and there. Right. And a couple of uh, quick questions. One is, uh, as you know, here in the, in the US, we're still around, uh, best my understanding, around 35% radial. Here you have a very complex anatomy, also circuit development. Your, your laboratory uh, uh, primary, for, you know, radial first? Yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're high users of radial access. Um, we do about probably around 70 to 80% radial. And with the slender seven French radials, we're, uh, we're, um, we're um, even getting more comfortable doing, doing more complex cases with bigger sheaths radially. Um, and the anatomy did not look like it would have been a complex anatomy that I would struggle with support. So I think radio would, would work fine here. Perfect. And one last question here to wrap it up. Uh, you know, uh, is, is there's also some geographical variation in the center experience. Some people are using Impella, some people are using ECMO, other mechanical circulatory support. Uh, for access, uh, uh, any particular tips uh, such as use of ultrasound, fluoroscopy, uh, any, any thoughts on the best access, particularly for this large cannula? in setting up an emergency? Yeah, if you, if, if you had time and wanted to be sure that you, because mo, mo, one of the major complications with ECMO is vascular access mm -hmm. of ischemia and bleeding. So if you had time, um, being careful about your access, getting good access is important. Um, if I had time, I usually use a micro catheter, a four French sheath. I've confirmed that I'm, uh, my puncture site is, is in an excellent position before upgrading to the bigger size tubes. Um, f I use fluoroscopy. Uh, some of my colleagues use ultrasound, but I haven't uh, been as versed in that. Well, thank you very much. Great case. All right, thank you. All right. Thank you.